All right, in my little series here of kicking banks, <laughs> um, this one right here, um, the Bank of New York, 200 years of looking ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure, looking ahead, you know, towards what, the Mark of the Beast system? There we go. And this is their book. Again, their book. Um, not an uh, anti-banking book and whatever else. Commemorating the Bicentennial of the Founding of the Bank of New York. There you go. An interesting thing here. We'll start out on page six. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, here we have page six. Page six. Starting up here, lodging houses and shops lined the lower part before they yielded to fashionable residences closer to Broadway. At the corner of Broad near Alexander Hamilton's home, there's a guy in the whole banking thing bringing banking, using banking to control America. It was a bad man. Home at 57 Wall was the new, or was the city hall, Maiden Lane, just a few, few blocks uptown was New York's northern edge. The homes and businesses of the city's merchants, merchant princes were all nearby within a short walk of one another. One of the buildings was the merchant's coffee house. The gentleman who met there on February 24, 1784, in response to the notice in the packet, constituted a social uh, register of post-revolutionary New York. Merchants and lawyers, they were the backbone of the city's economy, men of property and influence, almost irrelevant now that the war was over and how they had differed in their views toward the mother country. Several, several had clearly been loyalists, openly siding with the British. Others like Alexander Dougal and Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton in other words, had fought with Washington's army. Now they found themselves joined in a new common cause, securing the health of the new government and restoring economic vitality. The war's over, now how can we make more money? You see? Oh, people had uh, lost a lot of things and whatever else from the war, so um, they're going to need some uh, little bit of financial help. Let's see what they have to say about gold here on page nine. Here's page nine. Common specie of the 1780s. They call gold coin specie. The first notice of the establishment of the Bank of New York stated, "Quote: The stock to consist of specie only." Specie referred to the foreign coins of gold and silver, which were commonly accepted because of their sound basis in Europe and extensive use in maritime commerce. A representative of common specie of the time is shown on this page. Relative dollar value in the 1780s is shown below. So there you have the Johannes Ducat, Carolyn, British, Guinea, Dublin, and Louis Dior, however you say it. And there you can see the different types of gold coins on this page, the specie. Because you see, people back then wanted gold. They didn't want paper currency. Hmm. Nothing but gold and silver coin is to be used in public in payments or payment of debts, both public and private. That's what the Constitution says. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, here we have page 13. All this was carefully put into place over the course of a series of meetings before the commencement of business on June 9th. At the, on, at the outset, General Alexander McDougall, the man who succeeded Benedict Arnold as commanding officer of West Point and was the first head of the Society of the Cincinnati was appointed president. McDougall of Scott's birth and a son of liberty at the start of the revo revolution had come out of the war as a major general. The other directors were representative of New York's men of property, Isaac, Roosevelt, Alexander, Andrew, Hamilton, Covered Sands, and it goes on. But uh, interesting there. Promoted as a... Uh, quickly up through the ranks because of his banking connections. Alexander Hamilton was the chief organizer of the Bank of New York from its inception. 
He wrote the bank's constitution when he was 27 and served as a director of the bank all his life. After establishing the Bank of New York and practicing law in New York City, Hamilton became Secretary of the Treasury in 1789. <laughs> Real nice there. Okay, now we'll go to page 17. Okay, here we have page 17. Banks in general were suspected as being inherently evil. People didn't trust banks back when America was first founded, for good reason. Among the accusations was that they banished gold and silver by substituting paper. Huh. And not only were they vulnerable to charges that they were serving the needs of a small elite, but there were sinister suspicions that they were governed by foreign interests. No wonder then that the continued heavy importations of goods with their drain on specie, what do we learn about specie? It's gold coins, became a charge that opponents leveled against the Bank of New York. With Federalists so prominent among its officers, it was also easy to charge the bank with working in the interest of British capitalists. It was also contended that the bank had destroyed private credit as well, as in the words of a 19th century historian of New York's finances, that confidence, forbearance, and compassion formerly shown by creditors to their debtors, warnings were issued. If their number is not restricted, that banks are permitted in America after the profits they yield are known, we may not alone have one in every state, but also in every county of the different states. Hmm. If we don't stop these banks from going, they might actually end up in every state and in every county, too. How about in every town? Unreal. Absolutely crazy. And let's look at this picture here on this page, same page, page 17. Huh. Mind your business. I guess is what that's supposed to say down here at the bottom. Bisney or something. Hmm. Okay, it says, a keg of some 5,000 of these copper cents has been in the vault of the Bank of New York since 1789. The Fugio cent was the first coinage author, authorized by the Congress in 1787. Cents were badly needed at the time, but these minted by a private concern were under weight by government standards and could not be circulated at their intended value. Fugio meaning I fly in Latin and the phrase, mind your business, an expression of diligence rather than an admonition, surrounded a sundial with the sun and rays above it. The reverse side shows 13 joined rings representing the states, and within is the phrase, we are one United States. See, again, the original intent of America was not to have you know, the federal government was really not supposed to be there as a controlling thing over all the states. It was supposed to be independent states, much like you have the continent of Africa and the different, you know, there, it's not all just Africa there. No, there are different countries within Africa. Well, our states were to be different, you know, basically different countries. Um, united in the sense of we'll protect each other, but it's not supposed to be all just being told what to do by the federal government. Now, there are some variations between states in terms of law, but the federal government has way too much power right now, especially with the issuance of currency, which we have all become enslaved to, which is a problem. Okay. Um, page 18, let me go there. Okay, here we have page 18. We'll start up here. For 15 years, the Bank of New York stood alone as the generator of virtually all the commercial activity. Importers of tea and sugar, as well as the various other cargoes entering the port, turned to the, the bank for financing. Loans were on the quality of the paper offered for discount, but there was no firmer basis for a transaction than assurances that the merchant was sound, steady, and conservative. <laughs> yeah. There are no surviving records of the bank's currency issues during this early period, 
but we do know that General McDougall signed specie notes in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, and $100 denominations. Again, remember what is specie? It's gold coin. So he's signing notes saying this is backed up by gold coin. Um, the bank also became, along with the Bank of North America, the depository for the first foreign loans made by the United States. So now they're starting to get other people, dollar-derived currencies and things, you know, you hear about that, weaponizing the dollar, getting other countries into debt to the American dollar. So it started way back here, back in the late 1700s. What does that tell you? America, since its very inception, has been plagued with this whole banking, scheming things. That's why people were saying it was evil. And they were right. Let's go to page 41 next. Here we have page 41, an act. You can see the picture there. And it says here in the caption, on March 9th, 1830, the New York Life Insurance and Trust Company, my uncle used to actually work for them, Uncle Don Rao, um, was incorporated by the state of New York. The document, which reveals the names of so many prominent New Yorkers, including three directors and the president of the Bank of New York, is in the Bank of New York archives. So again, we're seeing how banking and insurance and trust company, how that they're all tied together. Very interesting. Let's go to page 47 next. I actually remember my uncle um, actually lost a lot of money from my father with his New York life insurance thing uh, during the whole 2008 situation. Lost quite a bit of my father's money that he'd worked hard for. Uh, gambling doesn't always pay. Actually, page 42, I missed that one. Okay, here we're at page 42. The bank, however, could not escape longer range effects. The disruption of a period of considerable pr prosperity had met the crisis by borrowing 112,500 pounds from Morrison, Kreider and Company of London and $100,000 from the Canal Fund in addition to a call loan of $195,000 from the Washington Insurance Company, payments of dividends were able to go on. In October of 1836, less than one year after the fire, the directors declared a 10% dividend. Hmm. Up here is a photo I'm going to read. From 1858 until 1875, the New York Clearinghouse operated on the top floor of 48 Wall Street. The room pictured above contained desks for, 50, for its 54 members where clock, clerks and messengers exchanged the previous day's checks and drafts. In other words, the beginning of Wall Street, right here, the whole stock market thing. Very interesting. And you say, brother, I don't understand the importance of all this because I'm trying to under, help you to understand that what we have today, it's a scam, this whole thing. America, you know, oh, America was greatly blessed by God and whatever. No, actually, it was not. Um, America was blessed by God by having free speech. That is true. Christians have been able to be here for a long time and not be persecuted. But the prosperity, if you point to prosperity as a way to prove that God blessed this nation, uh, you're very ignorant of history. God didn't bless America through the prosperity. This nation has been overrun by corrupt banking practices since its very inception. Oh, we've gained our independence from London, except in the financial world. <laughs> you know, we'll just kind of get our money from them, and we'll just give money back and forth, and we'll trade things and whatever else. Pretty sickening. Let's go to page 47. Here you have this photograph. The great seal there. National credit. It's what's building the country. It builds our military and our pioneers and everything else and our capital building. See? And what does the caption say down here? Uh, this is a portion of a mural in the center of the east wall of the main building floor at 
the Bank of New York, 48 Wall Street, the phrase National Credit 1861, the Presidential Eagle Medallion, and the raising of the flag on the right indicate the banking, backing the Bank of New York gave to the federal government in yet another time of crisis. The building in the rear is the new sub-treasury at 26 Wall Street. Huh. That's rather interesting, isn't it? Um, and up here it says, um, Mayor Woods' bravado must have been must have had many sympathizers among the city's over 800,000 residents. In the recent elections, most, most had remained loyally democratic and anti-war by favoring Stephen Douglas over Lincoln. Workers, especially those in the textile trades, were dependent in southern commerce. So many of them were recent immigrate, immigrants and engaged in mental, uh, or menial, excuse me, menial labor that they also feared the competitive consequences of abolishing slavery. Although Mr. Lincoln had not called for manumission, merely for drawing the line at where involuntary servitude already ex existed, abolitionists were among his strongest backers and the possibility posed a real threat. Men of finance were not far behind in dreading such a war. A great deal of their commerce, especially cotton um, exporting, was tied to the rebellious states. Southerners owed northern businessmen and bankers close to $3 million, which could easily go down the drain with secession. The effects of the 1857 panic were being overcome, and 1860 had begun with conser considerable confidence. The failure to elect Mr. Douglas, however, had jolted European investors, and the money markets had begun to react. $30 million uh, worth of call loans were withdrawn by those worried about American securities. Smaller banks in the West also began to recall their deposits. Stock prices were down, going down, and after Lincoln's election, funds were withdrawn at a more rapid pace. At a time of year when banks normally expected credit expansion, they were forced to reduce their loans. The foreign exchange market was further de demoral, yeah, demoralized by the collapse of the cotton export trade. That November, specie payments were suspended by southern banks, and the value of bonds from those states plummeted, jeopardizing banks in the West, which depended upon the, them as collateral for issuing their own notes. In New York, with the financial crisis becoming so evident, the clearinghouse banks met and formed a loan committee to respond to the situation. If war was unavoidable and the nation's ec economy needed safeguarding through the emergency, the hope was to provide more effective assistance than had been possible during the crisis of 1857. From the outset of the organization of the committee, its members included the vice president of the Bank of New York, Charles P. Leverich, uh, when its operations, operation was established to create clearinghouse loan certificates. Um, as a... Temporary uh, medium of exchange, Leverage became the custodian of the securities that were entrusted to the committee. On November 23rd, just after Lincoln's election, but well before the firing at Fort Sumter, Sumter an aggregate amount of $7,375,000 in such certificates were, was issued, uh, emphatic evidence of how the threat of war was unsettling the economy after its brief, brief recovery. And there's one of the guys that's being talked about here, Charles Palmer Leverage became vice president of the Bank of New York in 1853 and served as president from 1863 until 1876. He also he was also chairman of the New York City Clearinghouse in 1864. A southerner, Mr. Leverage had interest in southern commodities such as cotton, sugar, and molasses. Nonetheless, he served the bank and the union during the Civil War. Huh? A southerner serving the Bank of New York so he could get money? Off of the Civil War. Really? Hmm. All the uh, radical Southerners down there, their Southern pride and everything else. How's that work out for you? The North was funding the war. And a Southerner was the one that was in charge. A Southerner working for the North, the Union, funding the war and making money off of both sides. 600,000 dead American? 
men, millions more wounded, for what? The love of money is the root of all evil. That's what it was for. God isn't just in creating a place like hell. It's a terrible thing to think about that a loving God would send a, you know, people to a place to burn forever. Oh, not when you understand reality. Then you realize that God is completely justified in what he's done, creating hell. But I'll show you one more picture here from this uh, book on the Bank of New York. This is page 97. It says here, the onslaught of computer technology is evidenced by these uh, facilities at the Bank of New York. Government securities are cleared through a direct computer interface with the Federal Reserve Bank as a service to security dealers and brokers. The bank is the country's largest government securities processor. And of course, it's an older picture there. Uh, the computers are a little bit newer than that now. But... Um, so the Bank of New York is working directly with the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I'd say a few things there, but I'm trying to keep these videos to a, a minimum here. Fascinating, isn't it? Again, their own book that they put out, a centennial book. Now, I know all the other, you know, preachers out there, the pastors of the church buildings and things, They've already brought this information out in, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, the churches won't talk about this stuff. If you haven't figured that out already. Why? Because the churches are corporations. They're there to make money. You know what I mean? That's why they go to the banks and they get out the loan to build the big buildings to get you in to get your 10%. You understand? Oh, Denlinger is such a, a nasty, mean guy and whatever else. Um, I have to be a little bit radical sometimes to get you to understand just how bad things are. All right. I hope that you understand that. So, uh, <laughs> whew. I mean, again, like I've said, these quotes are coming from my wife, from her research, from her study. I don't, I can't read all these different books and things that she does. Um, but it just, it blows my mind. She'll come and she'll read this stuff to me. And I think, what, you know, the, the bank of New York is run by a man from down South. That's making money off the slave trade. And he goes up North to finance both sides. <laughs> what? No, it couldn't be that way. Oh, actually the bank that he worked for tells you that that's what they did. You had lied to. You've been deceived. You've been tricked. The world is a far worse place than you realize. You better get saved. You better make sure that your relationship to Jesus Christ is very strong. Because you live in a very fallen, very sick world. And when the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. They're all gone out of the way. There's none that feareth God. They're all turned aside. I saw this thing, this Jewish rabbi the other day. I was doing some research and I watched his video and and the, the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament and you know, Judaism today, we don't judge people for their sins. We look at, God looks at his creation and he loves all of his creation. And There doesn't have to be a mediator between God and man. You can just come right to God, to Hashem. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you. He loves everybody. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, gag a maggot, you know. I mean, some devil-possessed merchant uh, rabbi mingled papal Uden and he's going to tell me about God and that God doesn't have any wrath. God's not mad or anything and he just loves everybody. <laughs> uh, no, there's there's a reason that God created hell. Okay, it's for the devil and his angels, but uh, it's also for the servants of the devil and his angels. The ones that sell their soul for money and that will do all kinds of things to deceive you, to turn you into their slave, to turn me into their slave. We've been raised in this system of corruption. It's been here for hundreds of years. And now most of us just go, eh, yeah, sure, you know. You go back to the 1600s. Hey, translators of the King James Bible have um, 
Lancelot Andrews, I think, was one of the ones. And he can come and, and he says, oh, hello. And I say, oh, hey, well, it's nice to meet you. You know, hey, uh, let me show you around town here. I'm driving around the vehicle. And, and he'd be looking and he'd say, what's that? Well, that's a bank. Uh, you know, what's that do? You know, he'd try to explain it to him and be, that's horrible. You mean people actually would put their money in somebody else's building like that and then the building they spend it and they, they do all the stuff to scam people and and this bank is financing wars and these this the heads of the banks they look at these young men out there playing basketball down at the basket court down the street here a little ways and they look at the young men riding on their bikes and they say the bankers are looking at them guys and they're saying how can we get them killed in war oh yeah oh boy can we start a war Oh, we need a war. I can't wait for another war. Oh, boy. That's our world right now. That's how bad things are. Oh, but we don't need Jesus. We don't need God to intervene and stop this madness and whatever else. We'll just trust in evolution, you know. We came from goo, and I guess we're going to return to goo after all the wars. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we need the Lord. I think we need the Lord to come back and say, okay, that's enough to all these wicked banksters and everything else. Um, so I hope you've learned some things from these quotes. I know it's really technical stuff, and some of you might be thinking, I don't get it. I'm showing you original source documents from them showing how they control wars, they get people's money, they want to enslave you, they get you into all these insurance policies and mess you up and everything else. Do what you can to fight it, brethren. Come up with creative ways to have money outside of the bank. All right? Uh, don't get into all the insurance policies. And, and for goodness sake, don't send your children to these monsters' wars. They don't care. If you're a young man and you're thinking about joining the military, don't. Okay? Especially the modern military. The old military where it was all men, officers, and things a little bit more respectable. This modern military, no way. And I'll tell you, there aren't many preachers that will talk this way. Most preachers, they fly the little military ensign up front, you know, because they're government uh, organizations there, they're church buildings. And they are. It's, the, it's a military ensign. Do the research. Look it up. Gold fringe flag with a gold eagle on top is a military flag. They fly them in church buildings. Look them up. I'm not joking. And that's why these pastors are saying, oh, let's, the, hey, young man, so-and-so here, he's just joined the military and he's going to be going and fighting for our country. Oh, it's wonderful and everything. They're working for the banks. They want you dead. And these hirelings, these ministers of Satan, they're com completely covering this whole thing up. And if I have done the research, my wife and I done the research these guys could be doing it too, but they won't do it because they're in the back pocket of the banks and the banksters. Some of them are probably Freemasons as well. That's another thing. So uh, I will do my very best to warn people, no matter what it costs me. And I hope that you take heed to what I'm saying, to what I've showed you from the banker's own documents. That will be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please be careful who you listen to and um, what you're doing with your life.